That's just the last time, though. Like, she's, it's all. Yes, that's, I mean, that's okay. That's, I'll figure it out. It's like this same kind of. Yeah. Da, 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 yeah. And then, look, I'll sing the same thing with you on the bridge. Okay. I was thrown off by that. You won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Come right after me. No law, you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Yeah. So you'll do that first one two times, and I'll sing it with you that first time. Stay on it, I'll move, and then you move to what I'm singing, okay. and I'll move higher. Oh my gosh, I know. Yeah. Careful on that. It is like, careful on that. When you go to the 4-4, four, four, listen for that accent. The accent. We got back on, but there was a part, you know, where we were like, reckless love. That's why I did it. Cause Good morning, Due West. My name is Shelley Kubek, and I'm the director of the preschool here at Due West United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you are joining us in worship this morning. As we worship together, here are a few things to be aware of. Mark your calendars to attend Monumental VBS, Monday, June 6th through Thursday, June 9th. It will be a wonderful time for our kids to learn all about God's love. Online registration officially opens today. If you are interested, you can sign up through the sign up tab on Church Center. Looking for something to do this summer? Due West is offering a variety of summer camps for kids of all ages. Sports camps, science camp, preschool camp, and musical theater camp are just a few. Be sure to check out duewest.org forward slash camps for a complete list and to register. High school seniors and current college students are invited to apply for the Due West United Methodist Men Phil McGuire Memorial Scholarship. The applications for this scholarship can be found on the youth page of the website. Applications are due back by May 20th and recipients will be invited to a luncheon on July 10th. If you have any questions, reach out to the church office. We are so excited about the work and ministry of Waymakers Women's Center. Next Sunday on Mother's Day, Waymakers is going to be sharing a way for you to continue to support their work save your change and look for announcement next week. 
Now join us together and worship Jesus the Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. We're glad to have you here. Uh, usually, uh, our Lathan Pastel, uh, one of our pastors, would be here welcoming you, but he is home with his wife. Uh, if nothing happens in the next less than 24 hours, they will induce Cammie tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Uh, so that's exciting news. Keep them in your prayers. Uh, also, just some good news. We've been asking you all about helping us raise money for the roof of Building A. Uh, we needed $95,000 by the 15th of May. We had over $100,000 as of last week. So that's something to praise God for. <laughs> so we appreciate your generosity. And if, there's, if you're wondering, what are you going to do with all that extra money? Good news, we have other things that need to be done around these buildings. Uh, so that, it will be put to good use. But thank you for that. Finally, if you're new with us, please make sure you stop by our visitor center, uh, see what's going on in the life of the church, uh, and, and let us know who you are. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to, uh, to worship you together, we are so thankful that your spirit is in this place. Lord, move us, move in us, move through us, move among us, so that you will be drawing us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I want to invite you guys to stand up. We're going to worship God today. We're going to start by making a joyful noise and a loud noise, and we're going to give him all the glory. Yeah. Come on, let's put your hands together.
Amen. Y'all have a seat for just a moment. Uh, every week we like to showcase some of what God is doing here at Due West. And so we have some pictures this morning from our preschool graduations, plural, because uh, it feels like we've been doing them every day uh, for all the different ages. More than 200 kids in our preschool, and we've had a chance to let parents come in and hear a little bit about what's going on and to celebrate uh, what God is doing in the lives of these children. We're able to offer the preschool, as we do everything, because of your faithfulness and generosity. So as our ushers get ready to pass our offering plates, we just want to say thank you for all that you do uh, to make it possible for us to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to be generous to you so that you can pour out your love and your mercy and your grace to us and to the community around us. So Lord, receive these gifts today and use them in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in worship, I just invite you, as you are, passing the place, just sing, meditate, think about the amazing love of Jesus Christ.
So we sing to you, and so we continue to praise your name. We sing hallelujah to the one who died and rose again. The one who carefully thought out every step. You are the God we praise today.
shame it would be if we didn't get to worship you every breath we took. Lord, let us not wait. Convict our hearts. Draw us to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke's gospel, 24th chapter, starting with verse 33. If you have your Bibles, Luke 24, starting with 33, or as always, it's on the screen. This is what it says. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, speak to us this morning. And speak to us as you spoke to your disciples and assured them, of what was next. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what's next? That's the series that we're starting today. And you might notice there's no punctuation there, although there could be. You could have a question mark, because sometimes people want to know, what's next? You could have an exclamation point, because sometimes you want to say to somebody, let me tell you so you know what's next. It can go either way. And sometimes, both. Uh, I remember when our first daughter was born, our first child was born, uh, you know, at the hospital, they, you have all these nurses, you have all this help, it's great, and you think they're going to send you home with a nice big book to tell you how to do everything, uh, but we didn't get that somehow. But then you have all the, you know, you remember the first time you brought your child home, the first time you laid them in their bed, the first time you gave them a bath. Well, the first time we bathed our daughter uh, we got those little baby bathtub, right? And, uh, my wife is here. We uh, put it on the kitchen counter, and we ran the water till we got just the right temperature. Check it. You know, then you filled the tub. Does it feel good to you? It does. How about you? Yeah. You want to double check? Well, yeah, we probably ought to. Still feel okay? Yeah. And by the time you assure yourself it's okay, it's gotten cold, right? So then you have to dump it and start all over. So we started all over, and so we've got this thing filled with a, just the right temperature, we lay our precious firstborn child in it, and we look at each other like, now what? Uh, we had never done that before. What's next? I get, you don't get a book. So we're staring at each other. Fortunately, her mom was in town, and as it turns out, her mother had actually bathed a real baby before. Uh, she had some experience. So she was able to tell us, this is what's next. Here's your next step. Sometimes it's a question. Sometimes... It's an assurance. There's some things I just like about those two words. They lean forward, right? 
you know you're talking about something to come. Nobody strolling down memory lane, talking about the good old days, is worried about what's next. They're in the past. These two words are pointing you to the future. And even if you're unsure and apprehensive about what's next, you know something is. Something is next. There's this sense of anticipation. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some scriptures where there was this sense of anticipation. People were looking, the disciples of Jesus specifically, were looking into the future, wondering what's next. All of our scriptures will come after the resurrection. We just a couple of weeks ago celebrated Easter. So we're going to be looking at scriptures that take place after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, for us, Easter is a time of joy. But if you read the Easter stories in the Gospels, for the disciples, there was fear, confusion. They wanted to know what's next. And so Jesus was there to tell them and us what was next. Our first scripture in this series comes from Luke 24. Uh, in Luke 24, the Easter story is there, of course. Women come to the tomb. The stone has been rolled away. They're not sure what to do. They run and they tell some of Jesus' disciples. And it says that Simon Peter, we all know about Simon Peter, he came and looked at the tomb, and it, this is what it says about it. He went away wondering to himself what had happened. So he goes away scratching his head. We're still on Easter morning. After that, Luke tells us that there were two disciples. One is not named. The other is named Clopas. Anybody name your child Clopas? Yeah, okay. I just thought of that. Uh, it says that they take a walk from Jerusalem, where the crucifixion and resurrection took place, to a village called Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile walk. Think about a seven-mile walk. Uh, on average, uh, again, average pace, two and a half hours. So they're walking on this road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They have time to chat. They're talking about everything that has gone on in the last 72 hours. Good Friday, Saturday, which was quiet, and now the rumors from Sunday morning. And the story says, suddenly, a third person was with them. Now, we know it was Jesus, but they didn't realize that yet. So all they know is suddenly there's a stranger walking with them. So he walks up and says, howdy, boys. Uh, what you talking about? What's going on? And they said, what do you mean, what's going on? Are you the only one that doesn't know what has just happened? Don't you watch the news? And he says, well, I would watch the news, but my cable's out. I have Comcast. Uh, and uh, so they have to say, well, let us tell you. We had this buddy named Jesus, and we thought he was the man. We thought he was the one that would redeem Israel. We thought he was really the Messiah. But then on Friday, we saw him die. But this morning, some of the women in our group, they said they'd seen him. They said he's alive. We don't know what to think. And so Jesus says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, the prophets tried to tell you what was coming next, and you missed it. And so it says that beginning with the Old Testament, Jesus walks them through the Scriptures, how they all ultimately point to him, to his life, his death, and his resurrection. And they get to Emmaus, and he says, well, it's been fun, but y'all, I got to go on. Jesus, I'm sure, said y'all. Uh, I got to go on. And they said, listen, it's dinner time. Why don't you stay? So they gather at the table. And Jesus, who is the guest, they think, sits down and takes the bread, which normally a host in their culture would have done. Thanks God for it. Breaks the bread and gives it to them. Just as he had done less than 72 hours earlier with his disciples in the upper room. And it says in that moment, they know, they know that it's Jesus. And then it says Jesus disappeared. And then they returned to Jerusalem. 
Verse 33, where we started, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. This is the they they're talking about. These two disciples that just walked that walk with Jesus. They got up and returned to Jerusalem. Now remember, they started their day in Jerusalem. They walked seven miles to Emmaus. Now they're going to turn around and go seven miles back. It might have been a leisurely stole, stroll from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but you know they went back on a dead sprint, right? They couldn't just pull out their phone and say, you won't believe who just sat down at my table. They couldn't do that. They had to go back to Jerusalem. So they're running back full speed to tell everybody the news. And you know how that conversation's going. As they're running along side by side, one of them says, I knew it was him all along. And the other one, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, yeah, I just didn't want to embarrass you. Uh, but they get back to Jerusalem where the disciples are hiding out in an upper room. Now, Luke doesn't tell us that they're hiding out behind locked doors, but John's gospel does. They're afraid. They're grieving. They're confused. They're hearing all these stories, but they also know the Romans put Jesus to death, and who knows, maybe they'll come for them next. So they're hiding out. They're hiding out. When these two guys come in and they say, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. But the disciples, these guys who spent three years with Jesus, where are they? They're hiding out behind a locked door. If you ever wanted to hide out, maybe you were unsure of what was next. Maybe you were frightened by what was next. Maybe you didn't want to face what was next. You ever just wanted to go into hiding? It's amazing how many people have had that feeling and how many people that might surprise you that actually have done it. There's a great story in the Old Testament, a fellow named Elijah, one of the great prophets of God in the Old Testament. God did all these miracles through Elijah. His story has been found in the book of 1 Kings. One of my favorite Elijah stories took place on top of a place in Israel called Mount Carmel. A little over three years ago, we had a group from Israel there, and we got to go to Mount Carmel and see the place and see this big statue of Elijah. See, when he was around, he was a prophet of the true God, the God of Israel, our God. But there were also false gods. And one of the most uh, well-known false gods was named Baal. Now, why you name your false god Baal, I, I don't know. But he was Baal. And the problem was, the people of Israel weren't following the God of Israel. They were following this false god. And that included the king. The king was a believer in this false god. And just like the true god had prophets, the, the false god had prophets. 450 of them. So Elijah says, okay, we need to deal with this. So he sends word to the prophets of Baal and says, uh, let's have a contest. We'll get together on Mount Carmel. You call on your God. Excuse me. You build an altar and call on your God to send fire from heaven. I'll build an altar, call on my God to, fill, to send fire from heaven. And whichever one sends the fire, we'll all agree that's the real God. Deal? They said, deal. So they meet up on Mount Carmel. Two altars are built. The, Elijah says, you go first. So prophets of Baal... They start praying to their God, send fire. Nothing happens. They pray more. They cry out more. Send fire. Nothing. Well, this goes on for a good chunk of the day. And finally, Elijah says, hey, why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe your God's in the back taking a nap. I mean, he just starts mocking him. I know it's hard to believe that a man of God can be filled with so much sarcasm. I know that's a shock to y'all. Uh, but it does happen from time to time. Uh, so he just goes at him, and nothing. But then it's Elijah's turn. He says, listen, let's make this interesting. Get some water and douse my altar with water. So they do. Do it again. Do it a third time. So now this is all soaking wet when he calls on the God of heaven to send fire, and God sends fire. Water's gone, fire ignites, uh, and it's clear that Elijah's God, the God of Israel, is the one true God. 
Now, you would think with a great victory like that, surely his faith would have been riding high. What could he be afraid of at that point? I mean, you'd think there was nothing that could worry him. Well, remember, the king kind of liked this false god. So the queen sends word and says, okay, you just embarrassed the king. We're coming after you. You won't live to see the sunset. And Elijah, who's just seen God do this great miracle, what does he do? He runs away. He runs away. He says, I just wish I were dead. He's in hiding. This guy who should have had more faith than anybody decides to run and hide, just like the disciples. You ever just wanted to go somewhere and hide because you were afraid of what was going to come next? I read a story about a, a fellow who taught in a seminary, trained pastors for his denomination. He'd done it for a while. People liked him. He was well-known, well-respected. But he started to feel like God was calling him to do something else. He goes to see his dean and says, you know, I think at the end of the year, I need to step away. And the dean says, are you not happy? Is there something, you know? Uh, and he said, well, I, I'm not sure what's next, but I feel like God wants me to do something else. So he starts praying. And he really feels like God wants him to start a new church. So he goes to the leaders of his denomination and he says, I know usually you get younger guys than me to start new churches, but I feel like God is calling me to do this. And they said, listen, we, we know you, we respect you, your resume speaks for itself. If you want to do this, that's fine. Where do you want to go? He said, I don't know. Where's their need? And they said, well, we were thinking our, the next church we're going to start was going to be in Omaha. Uh, we just don't have a really a good footprint there. Now, He'd never been to Nebraska, but he and his wife prayed about it and decided if that's where they were needed, they'd go. So that's why you move to Omaha, I guess, if God clearly says you got to do it, right? So they pack up and they move. If you're from Nebraska, I'm sorry. Uh, so they pack up and they move to Omaha. Now, if you're starting a new church, you don't just walk into a pretty building filled with people, right? You start with next to nothing. I mean, when Due West started, there was no building. It was meeting in the elementary school next door. So he goes and he has to spend months meeting people, establishing relationships, trying to kind of test the waters. Who might be interested in starting a new church? Who might be willing to be involved with leadership? Can you find people to, to, do, to be, be musicians, to run sound? Where are we going to meet? I mean, you got to get all these logistics in place. And once you get all that, then you have to say, all right, when are we going to start? Now we got to advertise. It took months and months. But finally, they had their first service. Went well. The church is building, the church is growing, and everybody thinks it's going great, except for him. He's afraid to tell anybody, but deep down he worries that he's carrying it all on his shoulders. And if he slips up, it could all come crashing down. And he couldn't get over that. And he started having panic attacks. And his wife knew something was going on, and he said, oh, I think I'm just tired. He was afraid to admit what was scaring him. But pretty soon, he started finding reasons to skip out on church meetings. He wasn't following up with people, and people started to notice something's going on. He said, I think I just need a break. So he took some time off. But the reality is, for all, that, all the ways God had blessed him, he was trying to find a way to go into hiding. If you ever just wanted to go and hide out somewhere because you were afraid of what was next. Well, he did. He did talk to a friend, got some good counsel, and he prayed a lot. And later in telling the story, he said, I was praying and he said, I, I never heard God's audible voice, but I did feel like God was speaking to me. And it's almost like he said, so have you ever read the Bible? Well, yeah, yeah, I used to teach it, God. Yes, I've, I've read the Bible. Have you ever read Matthew's gospel? Y yes, Lord, I, I'm familiar with it. I've read Matthew's gospel. Do you remember what I said to Simon Peter at Caesarea Philippi? Yes, Lord, I know the story. What did I say? You said, on this rock, I will build my church. And the Lord said, that's right. I didn't say on this rock, you'd build my church. But somehow that's what you heard. Because that's what you're trying to do. 
you need to realize you're not in the building business. I am. You serve, let me build. You're worried that it's going to crash down because you think you're building it. Once you realize I'm building the church, you realize my church will stand. Elijah wanted to hide, and he did. He's hiding in a cave. And you know the story? It says that a big wind comes along, but the voice of God was not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake, but the voice of God is not in the earthquake. And then there's a fire, but the voice of God is not in the fire. Finally, there's a still, small voice where the Lord says to Elijah, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I've got this. The disciples were locked in the upper room. They were afraid of what was next. They were hiding out. And what does it say? Suddenly, Jesus appeared. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Can you imagine? You're in there. You're scared to death. You're confused. You don't know what's next. Bartholomew looks at Matthew and says, what do you think we ought to do? He looks at John and says, you got any ideas? He looks at Jesus and says, oh, hey, Jesus, I didn't know you were. How'd you get here? The doors are locked. And Jesus says, you're all worried about what's next. Let me tell you what's next. Peace be with you. My peace is next for you. Peace is that passes all understanding. Take a deep breath and know that I'm here. I'm with you. Because here's the thing. Sometimes God's voice is clearest to us in those moments when we're trying to hide out. Those words of assurance, comfort, and peace. I'm sure it felt that way in the upper room. A lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty on Thursday night. Jesus is about to be arrested. The next day, he'll be crucified. They're not sure what's next. But Jesus speaks to them and speaks to us and assures us that he is with them as he's with us. Assures them and us of his mercy, his grace, and his love. Let's pray. Lord, as we prepare to gather at your table, remind us that whatever's going on, even if we, like the disciples, might be filled with fear and confusion, you're with us. You speak words of comfort and assurance that the future is yours. You know what's next, and you'll be with us. So, Lord, as we prepare to receive this sacrament, we confess anything that's in our life that might separate us from you. Anything that might distance us from you. Lord, take all that away so that we can draw near to your table and to your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I remind you that on that night in the upper room, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, broke it gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body and it's given for you. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your spirit on us as we gather here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Lord, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let me invite those who are helping serve to come forward. Uh, 
As you come forward, I'll remind you that uh, it's an open table. You don't have to be a member here. All you simply have to come and acknowledge your need for God's grace, place your hands in the shape of a cross to remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. You'll be given a piece of bread, invited to dip it into the chalice. Uh, if for uh, sanitary reasons you want a self -set, self contained packet we still have those or if you need gluten-free elements these are gluten-free just let us know and we're happy to give those to you body of christ given for you body of christ given for you body of christ given for you blood of christ shed for you The table is open and you're invited to come.
following our benediction, turn, greet your neighbor, tell them God bless them. Tell them you enjoyed worshiping the Lord with them today. Lord, send us forth on this day, having been nourished by your bread and this juice. Send us forth, empowered to remember always that no matter what's going on, you know what's next. For the future is in your hands. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we worship. In Jesus' name we go forth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.